Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Welcome to another Vaccination Database uh, Seminar Talk. Today we're excited to have Andre Borini. Uh, he is the CTO and co-founder of McObject. Uh, which is the uh, the company that that develops ExtremeDB. So I've known that about ExtremeDB for a long time because uh, when I was working on MMA databases, ExtremeDB was a, you know a commercial example of, of a system. So we're excited for Andre to come talk to us about what you know, what what they're actually doing because um, there there isn't a lot of papers about this. So uh, Andre is uh, as I said the, the co-founder and CTO. He also holds a uh, an undergrad degree and a master's degree from from uh, University of Moscow. Um, so uh, if you have any questions for as Andre gives the talk, please unmute yourself, uh, say who you are and where you're coming from, and feel free to interrupt at any time. We want this to be a conversation for, for Andre and not him talking to the empty space that is void. Okay? Andre, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Andy. And um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad I, I can share the, uh, our new development with all of you. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, predictable database management in embedded applications. Um, uh, before I do that, uh, what I'd like to do, I'd like to set the stage um, from the uh, industrial standpoint. Uh, so I'd like to uh, share our motivation with you. So uh, uh, commercial database management, um, have been used in has been used in embedded systems for 20 years now and these days developers don't even debate whether to buy or uh, uh, or uh, build their own database management for embedded systems uh, it's those components are, are almost always bought um, how, however what surprised me uh, in in the last few years uh, those commercial um, database management uh, uh, software uh, st started um, started appearing in in uh, systems that uh, long been off limits for any commercial vendors. Uh, systems like certain type of medical devices, um, radiation uh, radiation devices, or uh, they call it cyber knife. Um, aircraft navigation systems and avionics and pilot assistant, assistant programs. Uh, recently, most recently, it's autonomous driving that uh, people all hot and bothered about, uh, driver assistance systems of various kinds. So um, altogether, they can be called mission critical or safety critical applications. So where the failure of the system uh, is likely to co to cause harm, uh, and of course, real-time operating systems are widely used. Uh, but uh, again, surprisingly, uh, other middleware components like file systems or network stacks or database management systems are always are, are, are in demand. Now, uh, the requirements of those. Uh, mm, uh, of those applications uh, are frequently defined as real-time constraints on, uh, on system temporal behavior. So we see the need uh, for a commercial database management system that preserves the temporal validity of uh, data and implements predictable execution of critical transactions. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our latest uh, design, latest addition to Extreme DB, and that is predictable transaction management. <clears throat> now, uh, I uh, would like to structure this talk uh, uh, in the following way. Uh, first, I'll talk about Extreme DB as a system, what it is and what it is not. Uh, then I will. Um, focus on a few 
internal uh, components of extreme EB that are relevant to, uh, to the real-time design. Now, after that, I, I will go into the real-time design and this is not, it hasn't been uh, a product yet. Uh, it's, it's, it, it is what it is, it's a design. And I explain how we, uh, uh, how we implement uh, real-time constraints on the database uh, transactions. And then if we're all awake, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of uh, the actual implementations for different, uh, different real-time operating systems. So uh, what ExtremeDB is not? Uh, it's not an enterprise client-server type of database. It's not, an or it's not Oracle, it's not MySQL. It's, on the other hand, it's not a simple key value pair such as Berkeley DB. It's not entirely an OSQL database. It's not a simple cache system. So let's see what it is. First and foremost, it's a professional developer tools to integrate very high performance databases into uh, various native languages, C and C++, Java, Python, Lua, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, ExtremeDB is implemented as uh, a set of libraries that collectively are called database runtime. Uh, we provide a SQL level API. We also provide other modules and next slide will show you uh, the entire ecosystem of ExtremeDB capabilities, but essentially it's an API for, it's an API for different languages. Your applications can be written in Java, Python, .NET, many, many different languages. So uh, it's a, it's, it, once your, once ExtremeDB libraries are linked with your application or used with your application, uh, your application uh, is capable of creating fully transaction compliant uh, database. Uh, and we provide a rich set of different index algorithms. Uh, we support all C language data types. Uh, and some of the C++ language, uh, 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 C++ data types like variable length strings, uh, vectors. Uh, we also uh, support vertical layout as well as horizontal layout. Uh, and uh, also ExtremeDB includes uh, various distributed options. So the database itself can be uh, either used for high availability like Master slave in master slave uh, setup. It could be used as a cluster uh, where each node is equal. Uh, we support sharding, we support different, uh, different multi layer um, communications between different nodes uh, in the architecture. So, this is the big picture. Uh, the big red circle in, in the middle it's, it's, it's an extreme DB kernel. And uh, as you can see, uh, there's a rich set of, of indexes. Uh, we support multiple data layouts. Uh, dynamic data layout is when your objects, when your records are variable length. Uh, there's a different data layout that supports small records that are fixed length. We support blobs, vertical layouts. We support multiple transaction managers. Uh, transaction managers based on MVCC, uh, MVCC, multi-versioning concurrency control and uh, pessimistic uh, transaction managers. ExtremeDB supports both transient and persistent storage. Uh, we support uh, in the kernel. Uh, we also support multiple, uh, um, multiple synchronization um, so multiple notification uh, events, which is quite important for embedded systems. Uh, so uh, that's, that's in the kernel. And outside the kernel, you can see uh, so much different models, so much different capabilities. Uh, I talked about a little bit, mentioned the, um, the uh, distributed uh, components, high availability cluster. We also have a full-blown SQL engine uh, we've got um, 
uh, various memory compression, various backup capabilities, multi-language support, anything that you can think of is there. And to that extent, ExtremeDB has been around for 20 years. So there's no surprise that uh, uh, we, had, we have so many components that, that are integrated with the, uh, with the product. Now, uh, going back to, uh, to the API. So ExtremeDB provides two uh, types of API. There is an API that we call static API, which is basically uh, uh, implements database control, transaction control, uh, cursors, error handling, type of that nature. Now, there's also a so-called dynamic API. Uh, dynamic API means that you as a developer describe your data in, in a very simple language. Uh, our own as a proprietary language. And then based on that description, we generate the database access API. Uh, <clears throat> so this is how it goes. So your data is first described in, 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 in your, with the data definition language. It is similar in semantics in, in C to C++ and very easy to use and learn. And then we have a tool that takes the data description and generates essentially a C API. So uh, the good thing about it that you don't have to learn, you as a developer don't have to learn any um, cryptic, uh, API, any cryptic functions to access the database. If you know the description of your data, you intuitively, know, intuitively know, know your API as well. So it's easier, it's, it's quite easy to actually use ExtremeDB to that extent. <clears throat> now, this is the sample of, uh, of the database schema. Uh, it's uh, the, at the top. So we use the terminology class. So class is a table. Uh, in, this, in this particular, uh, on this particular sample, there's three different data fields, uh, an integer field and date time, another double, in, another integer field. And uh, there's a B tree index over uh, over two of uh, of those fields, and down below is uh, the generated API. Uh, you can see that uh, the, there's a function temperature new, for example, that uh, let you add data to allocate rather a new a, a new uh, record, uh, and then you can write and read data out of that record. And since there's an index, uh, there's a search API, uh, a lookup function that uh, you can use passing in a key and, and uh, search for data. Now, this is your typical sample uh, application in C. Uh, it's I'm oversimplifying it here, but what essentially happens when you program with ExtremeDB? Uh, you create a database and uh, it's the call to open database up top. And then uh, a task connects to the database through the connect API. Those are part of those control static API. From that point on, you can start using transactions and uh, 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 create either create new records or read data back. Uh, so essentially, what happens? You the application connects to the uh, connects to the database. Then start the transaction. Transaction can be either read only or or, or, or read write transaction. Uh, 
manipulate with data and then close the transaction. Transactions can be, of course, either committed or rolled back. So in this example, I mean, you, you'll see that it's, it's pretty trivial. So this record is created, a value is written into the allocated space. And then uh, uh, the next transaction is a read-only transaction that looks up, uh, looks up the, uh, creates, a, creates a data set, a rec uh, uh, looks up uh, uh, some data and uh, reads it back. So that's essentially the flow, uh, the code flow uh, for, uh, for application that uses ExtremeDB. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, a few words about physical layout, how we store data. So ExtremeDB supports the notion of logical database devices. Logical devices are simply an abstraction of your physical media. So uh, there could be two different media, media that we support. We support memory devices. Again, it could be conventional or shared memory. And uh, persistent devices. Persistent devices could, could be files, uh, multi-files. It could be raw partitions for that matter. <laughs> So regardless of the nature of the physical media, uh, all memory devices, all physical devices are logically divided into pages. Pages are simply fixed size segments. So uh, the top picture illustrates, uh, we have two in-memory devices uh, there. And uh, pages are simply free pages, are simply organized in, in, in a link list. So it's a very simple uh, page manager. Uh, every, everything in a database, whether it's an object, a variable length object, variable size object, or a fixed size record, or an index of any kind, everything is built upon these pages. So uh, the page manager simply takes the page out of the memory device and makes use of it, building, building uh, either a database record or an index for that record. Now, uh, the persistent, uh, uh, the persistent, the, 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 the picture down there, it's, it's illustrate the persistent database again. The persistent uh, storage is divided into pages. Uh, pages on the persistent storage are larger than the, the than in-memory pages, and that is to uh, minimize I/O. So uh, pages are put up in a cache, and cache is again is a memory device. And uh, then those pages internally are treated as a collection of a smaller pages uh, that uh, the database runtime, the database kernel, builds it builds objects and indexes and everything uh, uh, that the runtime uh, works with. So uh, let me say it again. Everything we, we have a number of page managers. So every object in a database is built upon those pages. <clears throat> now, transaction managers. Sorry, go back. Um, uh -huh. the, the previous slide, the, you, when you write to raw partitions, so that basically means you have to, like, you're given some device where it doesn't have a file system and you have to manage like, the data, like, the, you manage the, the partition yourself. Correct. Correct. Right. Correct. And so basically, you have to build your own sort of pseudo file system for your like for the data system. Um, can you talk about what is the performance 
benefit or improvement you see over what the custom file system you built for Extreme DB versus like you know, the same hardware just with, with the, the device having the file system, the OS, the OS providing the file system. Uh, like, do you see like a, the, the rough conventional wisdom is that like you see like a 10 to 15% improvement in performance by having the database and manage the files themselves. Do you see that in, in your deployments? Uh, well, it's not, it's not necessarily uh, uh, related to performance. Uh, file systems take, take space. Mm -hmm. File system takes overhead. So uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that this, there's some devices that just don't have a file system at all. And uh, when, uh, when we use a raw partition, we don't actually try to implement our own file system. We don't need all that functionality. All we need is a simple page manager. Mm -hmm. So we take that physical device or rather a driver that implement that implements normally it implements some sort of a block device interface and we use that block device to build our page manager performance wise well it depends modern file systems are very optimized mm -hmm. uh, and quite honestly when there is a file system we'd use one <laughs> sure <laughs> but uh, ExtremeDB is often put in the environment where file system is a drag. They're either badly written or they just take space. So uh, I can't really quantify whether it's 15% faster, um, but it, it could be. <laughs> okay. So, but like, out of curiosity, then like, if you say, if, if it offers you a file system, you'll use it. Like, mm -hmm. are you ever given the option of whether like for the for particular deployment, like you, you can use a file system to say, hey, you can get raw date, raw blocks or a file system and you guys always choose the file system. Or is it- is Well, it, people is it, normally, you know, I mean, it, de it, it depends on the application. When okay. the application runs on Linux or- yep. Uh, some other non-real-time non -real environment. Yes, obviously people use file system, not, not just because of the database, but they use file systems for a variety of reasons. Okay. So, and uh, internally we have, um, we call it file system wrappers. So we have our own very thin layer that looks like we access the file system. There's functions like seek, the normal, your, your normal POSIX file system calls. Okay. But the way we implement those, uh, they can be based on a, re on, on a real file system or they can be based on a block device and API. Okay. So that's, yes, and there's always a choice. <laughs> okay, all right, sir. Okay. So uh, let's go back to, to, to different transactions. So uh, we have, generally speaking, we have two different ways to implement transactions. Uh, and transactions are implemented through modules called transaction managers. So uh, one is called MURSIF, multi, multiple read, single write. That's, that's the abbreviation. And it's essentially implements pessimistic concurrency model. Uh, so it uses locks and um, it, it is implemented a very simple queue. So we allow multiple read transactions at a time and we allow only write, uh, only single write transaction at a time. So the write transaction blocks everything else. So, uh, and the other option is, uh, is uh, an optimistic concurrency model, which is based on MVCC. And of course, it allows multiple sim simultaneous re reads and writes. Um, and uh, we support all normal SQL uh, isolation levels, uh, read committed, repeatable read. Um, uh, MVCC is not, when you have, so uh, people use MVCC based manager when they have multiple 
tasks that access the, the database at the same time. In embedded environment, uh, there's no so many tasks that simultaneously access the database. It is in fact normally just one. And uh, the Mursif transaction manager is um, is very light. It doesn't 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 use many locks. Doesn't use um, mm, operating system primitives to to uh, to log the database. Uh, those are very expensive in performance terms. So I would say that generally speaking, half of our embedded applications use the Mursif based transaction manager. Okay. Now with persist now, now, now the next few slides I'll talk about rollback, uh, uh, rollback recovery mechanisms. So for, for persistent databases, um, uh, there are generally two uh, transaction logging policies. Uh, this is normal undo, immediate modification uh, transaction policy. And uh, there's also right ahead logging. And most uh, databases that are on the market uh, support, support both of those uh, transaction policies. I don't think that we need to go Father and discussing uh, the persistent rollback recovery simply because our real time design doesn't support persistent persistent databases at the time. But uh, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, it's there. What you expect from the normal normal uh, full blown SQL database, we do support various transaction logging policies on persistent databases. Now, uh, let's talk about transient in-memory databases and their recovery mechanisms. So essentially we have two different ways to roll back uh, transient uh, transactions, tra transactions on transient uh, databases. So one is quote unquote logical recovery uh, mechanism. So uh, I'll explain what's on the picture on the right just in a second, but I'd like to say, uh, to say this first. Essentially, um, this recovery mechanisms, mechanism, algorithm, is aware of the logical structure of the objects that are being rolled back. Uh, that has its benefits. Sometimes uh, uh, that has performance benefits. And uh, sometimes uh, it's beneficial from different points to know what is it that you modify to recover its, to, rec to, to then recover it back in, into, it, into its original state. So, so this logical recovery mechanism, it, it has been there for forever. So that was, that was our original recovery, recovery uh, algorithm. And it's generally oriented towards commits. So commit with our uh, logical recovery, uh, recovery mechanism is faster, is better. So, the other, uh, uh, the, the other recovery algorithm is mm, so-called physical, it's page-based, it's physical recovery uh, mechanism. Th this algorithm doesn't, is not aware of any, uh, uh, of any logical structure that is being recovered. So we simply, uh, take the pages that are modified in one way or another, put them away, we call that in a, in a rollback buffer. And when the recovery is necessary, those pages are simply copied back. 
So this recovery mechanism is rollback oriented in a way that when you have more rollbacks than commits, it's beneficial from performance standpoint, but also, which is what is very important, is deterministic in time. The reason it is deterministic in time is that because when you copy a page, that time can be very easily measured. And when you copy the same page back, it's the same time. So uh, we can prove, and I'll talk about this in, in, in a bit, that, uh, that this page-based recovery mechanism is in fact deterministic in time. So what you see on, on the picture on the right-hand side here is, um, is a sample of what happens to, um, uh, at the top, uh, at, at the top of this picture is the uh, logical, uh, uh, is the log it, sh it shows logical, logical um, uh, algorithm, logical recovery algorithm, algor algorithm. At the bottom is the physical recovery algorithm. And this is simply an example of, of, of what happens with, with the database objects when, uh, uh, when we update uh, a key value, a field which is indexed. Uh, I'm not sure that I need to go through this picture. It's on the slide. It's documented uh, pretty well here. I mean, it's, it says what it does. Uh, but uh, again, what I'd like you to take out of this slide is that the two algorithms, two mechanisms, one is page-based, it's physical, it's not aware of any uh, logical organization of the database or some of, of what is being recovered, and it's deterministic in time. Now, this is some statistical information that we collected to compare those two recovery algorithms. Uh, what you see here, uh, the, the blue line is the old, the logical, uh, uh, the blue um, plots. Is, is the logical recovery algorithms, and the red is, is, uh, is the physical, the new, the new method. Uh, so on each of those slides, the different operations. There's uh, delete operation, insert operation. The first one is insert, in fact. Uh, the second one is upsert, is when the key is modified. Mm, and the last one in the, in, in the left right corner is when the key is updated. What you see here is that uh, we run every transaction first. We first run the uh, update and this is called, this is the body. Then we run the commit. The third uh, plot here is just a summary of those two uh, Two, uh, two operations. And then the exact same transaction is run, uh, is run again, only it doesn't commit, but is, 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 it is rolled back. So what you see here, regardless of the, uh, of, of the operation itself, regardless of the transaction, it shows that the physical recovery is not so bad. It's, it's actually in par with the logical recovery. On this slide though, we see what happens with the rollback. And uh, this graph is normalized. The logical recovery is taken 100%, right? And you see that the physical recovery that uh, copy on, 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 copy on right based recovery, it, it normally takes just a fraction of time of what the logical recovery would take.
Now, uh, and this is the probably the last concept that I'd like to go over. And uh, this is just your normal transaction flow, extreme DB transaction flow. Again, I'm talking about the more safe, not MVCC transaction manager. So uh, you see a number of different operations on the left-hand side, insert, update, delete, delete all. And then uh, there's a workload. So the, the first thing that happens, the transaction is entered in, into a queue. It waits until it, it is allowed to run. Now, uh, it runs its work, work, workload. So there's some transaction body here. And then at some page, at some, as, at some point, uh, uh, the application calls commit and uh, those modifications are committed. In extreme DB commit is divided in two uh, phases. The first phase of the commit essentially updates indexes. And the last phase of the commit, it essentially, it's uninterruptible. It clear, clears up various, various locks, various um, latches rather. It's normally a very short in duration and it's, it's always, it's, it's atomic. There's no, um, there is no way that operation can fail. So the, 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 the second commit phase is very short and it's, it's always, always succeeds. Now, uh, the rollback, uh, if and when the rollback happens, again, this graph shows what operations happens when the rollback, uh, when, when the rollback runs. So it just, this picture gives you a sense of just generally how transaction is structured in, 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 in extreme DB. Two phase commit, there's a workload, there's a queue interval, there's a wait interval, there's a workload interval. Well, the transaction does its, does it work? And then uh, uh, again, two, two phase commit and the rollback is simply, if, if the rollback happens, it simply put, puts everything back to, uh, restores it to the, the original state, okay? Now let's talk about, uh, uh, at this point, let's talk about the real-time design and what happens with uh, uh, how we use extreme DB and what, what changes we made to extreme DB to, uh, to uh, enable uh, predictable, uh, predictable transactions. But first of all, uh, and that's, that's probably kind of marketing statement. Don't confuse fast and high throughput with real time. Uh, with real time, uh, any real time processing, uh, there's a line in the sand. So there's bad transactions and good transactions. Uh, with high throughput, uh, speed is just, it's, it's a figure of merit. So uh, with real time, speed is not so important as predictability. <clears throat> so here's our goals. What we'd like to do, we'd like, our, we'd like to impose and enforce transaction deadlines while preserving the consistency through ACID properties. Uh, essentially what we do, we introduce a deadline value into the transaction call. So why is it difficult? Uh, uh, why is it difficult algorithmically and why is it difficult technically? Well, first of all, enfor enforcing temporal consistency of data uh, it, um, and transactions. Uh, it's, it's never been, um, I'm gonna take it back. <laughs> So with real-time transactions, uh, transactions have their deadlines. So what can happen, they can meet their deadlines. So, so they, they can commit within the 
uh, time frame that they're given, they can miss their deadlines, which means that they, they are rolled back again within the time frame that they're given. But what should never happen is that never should run past their deadlines. So that's something that uh, real-time operating systems do. They guarantee predictable intervals. Now, database operations are very difficult. So the complexity evaluation of any database operations, it's hard to know the upper boundaries, boundaries in time of various operations. And it, it is also very difficult to make an accurate estimate of the time of, the, of, of execution on any level. It could be either application or the database kernel. And when you calculate the worst case scenario, you can tell, you can say that, yeah, we can, we can say that three operations, search operations are logarithmic. However, those worst case scenarios could be too pessimistic. They can be so pessimistic that they are almost useless. Now, real-time scheduling goals are, 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 are also different from, different from application to application. Some applications want to schedule transactions to minimize, to minimize the number of transactions that miss their deadlines, that are rolled back. They may or may not allow preemption could be high priority transactions that run in the context of a high priority tasks. And the database scheduler may or may not, may not allow preemption. Now, there could be other different criteria that uh, real time applications uh, impose. Like we can, for example, maximize the total weight of successful transactions. You can assign a number, like a deadline plus priority to a transaction, and your goal could be to maximize the total weight of successful transactions. So uh, essentially, schedule, scheduling goals are very different for real-time applications. Now, the success and performance criteria, again, they're not the same as for non-real-time applications. Performance criteria for your uh, uh, SQL normal, normal database, non-real-time database, is, uh, is normally to um, optimize the average number of transactions per second. With real-time uh, applications, it's not the average time, it's the worst case scenario. <clears throat> now, why is it difficult technically? Well, first of all, uh, real-time applications, they run in the context of a real-time operating system. And if they don't, uh, they have to be able to uh, access hardware, interrupts, memory management, timers, things of that nature. Now, real-time operating systems, they have different scheduling policies and different ways of measuring time. The database that runs in, in the context of real-time operating system uh, and the scheduler and recovery algorithms should be able to adjust to those, uh, to those services, operating system services. Now, uh, real-time applications, not always, are, are considered mission critical or safety critical. So, they, um, mm, their underlying operating systems is one of the certified, certified uh, operating systems. And uh, generally speaking, uh, <laughs> manufacturers approach uh, how, how operating system vendors certify their products. Uh, what they do, they cut system services that they cannot fit into the certification boundaries. Essentially, we have much less uh, functionality from the operating system than you would have on running on, on, on your normal Linux or Windows or non-real-time non OS. Now, the same certification rules are normally applied to, uh, to 
to development tools, compilers, profilers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And again, those tools are generally speaking safety oriented as opposed to anything else. So, uh, uh, well, that's that's a challenge. That's a technical challenge. Can, can you give an example from a, from a, something that the like the like real time OS is going to not have that like full fledged server class Linux is going to have that that you care about for a database? Sure. For example, um, semaphores. Okay. Yeah. In VxWorks, in real time version of VxWorks, certified version of VxWorks, you can take a semaphore, but you cannot can never release it. <laughs> Okay. Releasing, releasing a resource is considered a security risk because you actually can pull the rug out of your operation. That's, that's, what, that's what the thought is. Okay. So uh, allocating memory, it's a big no-no. You never can call alloc or malloc in, 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 in a certified environment. Again, the thought is that if you do, then you can forget to free it and you create a system, uh, you create a resource leak. So to that extent, ExtremeDB doesn't use any, uh, any system services that allocate memory. All our memory managers are our, are, are our own memory managers. And the same goes for, uh, for synchronization primitives. If we are able not to use a semaphore, we don't. We create our own latch instead that we can fully control. Did I answer the question? Yeah, that was perfect, thank you. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this slide shows why the real-time operating system is, is, is in fact essential. So what you see here is the two cases. Uh, well, let's see. So the, the, the top picture, you, you, see the, you see two threads running on macOS, doing something with a database, updating the database, running on the macOS, and on the right-hand side, on operate, under the operating system called Deals, it's a real-time OS. So uh, what you... You can tell from this slide that under macOS, only 12% 12 uh, 12 of transactions miss the deadlines. So all those transactions, they have the same priority. They run in the context of the same priority task. And uh, they ex essentially do the same thing. Under the real-time operating system, all of those transactions went, uh, ran successfully. None of them miss their deadlines. Now, the second example, the, the bottom picture, is when we have one transaction, a writer. Essentially, it's a sensor that populates data and writes the database. And it's a high priority transaction. The low priority transaction is a transaction that looks up the, date, the values and read data back. Again, if you look at this picture under general purpose operating system, uh, 12 percent of read transactions are, are missed, are missed, missed their deadlines. And in real-time operating system, due to their predictable scheduling policies, uh, Essentially, not all of them went through, okay? So that's the difference. What I'd like to emphasize here that real-time environment is essential for real-time database. Real-time operating system is essential for real-time database. How good is like, uh, um, like you can run Linux in like in RTS, RT mode, right? Like you can set the scheduler to be a real-time scheduler. Uh, how close is that to be like your, like, how good is that, how good is that for the database, for the stuff that you're doing? Uh, 
Honestly, we don't use RT Linux. <laughs> Okay. So go. I can't. I. I but why? Is it because no, because none of the, none of your people that are using Extreme DB are using it, or just because you, if it's out of the box, it doesn't do what you need. Uh, it's market oriented. Our customers run when when they run real time processing, they run real time okay. operating systems. They run VxWorks. They they run Integrity. They run Deals. None of them run Linux. Okay. Another another point here is that. Yes, real-time RT Linux and RT Windows, for that matter, can be quote-unquote real-time. But as I mentioned earlier, um, there's this certification requirement requirements in the applications that we deal with. And Linux, by definition, can never be certified. So uh, we deal with... Um, I would say 30% of the, uh, of the um, applications that this design is intended to would run on this certified operating system, which is never Linux. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. thank you. Now, how we deal with complexity evaluation for the real-time uh, real uh, uh, project? Well, we follow the footsteps of our of the operating system vendors, and we cut off those services that we can't or don't want to uh, uh, put in, in, into real time mode. As you can see here, all the mm. modules that are outside the kernel, are, are, we, we, we've gotten rid of it. We don't support that. So all we, uh, we have left is a low level backup capabilities. So, and inside the kernel, uh, we, uh, we've left three types of trees, of indexes rather, a B tree, a hash, and an R tree. And uh, we also don't support persistent storage at this point. We uh, only leave the transient storage. And, um, uh, we only support Morsif Transaction Manager. We don't support MVCC uh, Transaction Manager at all. Um, so that's the extent of, of the current design. We would have to, at some point, to add persistent storage support. And that is because um, many modern devices they do have persistent storage. Uh, it hasn't been done, it will be. <laughs> now let's talk about a real-time transaction schedule. Uh, so a uh, real-time database should guarantee the logical consistency ought to guarantee the logical consistency of the database and also make sure that transactions uh, meet their deadlines. So we implement a so-called high priority earliest deadline first scheduling algorithms. Transactions are scheduled for, for execution based on their priority and deadline. Essentially, when, uh, you, have, when you have two transactions, the first thing that happens is we see, are they the same priority or their priorities are different? If they're the same priority, we allow to run, we, we schedule to run transactions that, that, uh, which, that deadlines are closer, are shorter. So if uh, the priority of transactions are different, we first schedule the transaction with a higher priority. Now, we also allow preemption. So if you have a running transaction, uh, there's certain rules uh, and they're written here and um, that allow us to kick that transaction out. It doesn't happen always, but uh, if there's a higher priority transaction, uh, chances are that 
uh, the, the, the currently running transaction will be kicked out. Um, so again, is the high priority earliest deadline first EDF scheduling? And this is a pretty common scheduling me mechanism. But with a kick, we allow preemption. <clears throat> now, uh, so we, how we enforce deadlines through rollback. So uh, the database kernel, Again, firm, firm, firm transaction deadlines are uh, deadlines are enforced through EDF scheduling scheduling mechanism. So uh, we we must guarantee that transactions are finished, whether whether they missed the, whether they commit or roll back within their defined deadlines, right? So we uh, we are able to identify late transactions. Well, we're able to interrupt those transactions. And we are able to for, to initiate the rollback in time to satisfy the transactions deadline. And the key problem here is that we must ensure that when we interrupt the transaction, it's still in a recoverable condition. So we actually can run the rollback in time and keep the database consistent, logically consistent. Now, the way we do that, the database kernel, uh, the database runtime, reserves enough time out of the given transaction deadline to initiate the rollback. And we can prove, we can mathematically prove that the transaction's rollback uh, time is taken less, is, is less than the total time of the transaction has spent modifying a database. So, uh, that's um, that's the key statement, the key assertion here. Oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, again, we can guarantee that we reserve enough time out of the given deadline to be able to roll back all the modifications. So may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, so if you say you can prove that uh, rollback time is definitely less than the time spent modifying or searching, then does that mean that, say, if the deadline is one second, then at half a second, you have to roll back if you haven't finished everything? Because, I mean, you can only guarantee that the rollback time is at, at most to be the same time you have spent, right? Does that make sense? Right. Yes. Like, like for example, if the deadline is a second, or an hour for that matter. We can guarantee that we can roll back in half an hour. Yeah, so essentially if the transaction has not finished all the work within the first half an hour, then do I right. have to back? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now, uh, so how, much, how, many, how, much, how, much, how many more slides do you have left? How much time? How much time? About an hour in. Uh, we are, uh, let's see. <laughs> you probably need to okay. read that now. Uh, well, mm. give me give me another. I, I'll give you five minutes. T t five minutes, okay. <laughs> okay. When, right. when do you want me to start rolling you back though? Right, so uh, give me another five minutes. So here's my key assertion then. So the time to, re to reverse any modifications to the database made by a transaction up to any point in the transaction, it, it doesn't exceed the time required to apply those transactions. The rollback time is always less than the time uh, uh, that, that is, the transaction took to modify the data. And uh, as I said, uh, we can prove that. We can prove, prove it mathematically. Uh, what I'd like to do, I'd like to illustrate that. It's a pretty obvious statement for read-only transactions because read-only transactions don't actually modify any data. They modify internal structures, right? So uh, 
for, uh, uh, for the read-write transactions, the mechanism that I've described earlier, the page-based uh, uh, page -based recovery uh, is, uh, is the crux here. So since we need to copy pages, but the time that takes to copy a page is, depends on the size of the page, but this is all it depends on. So based on that simple fact, again, we can prove that putting pages back during a rollback wouldn't take more time than the original, uh, the original modification. And these two slides that they actually illustrate the process and there's code snippets that show what, what happens when, uh, when the transaction runs, when the real-time transaction runs. Uh, and uh, this is some statistics that we've collected to, uh, to, um, uh, to demonstrate our key assertion. And again, uh, it shows the blue line is the workload, the red lines are, are the rollback. And uh, we've, we've done a lot of research and a lot of uh, experiment and uh, testing in effect. And, uh, that verifies the assertion. I mean, it's not a proof, but it's, it's, it's an illustration rather. Uh, five minutes, did you say? Okay. Yeah, okay. Like, 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 you should wrap up because like, if you have any questions, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, it's not me, it's, it's the baby. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> so uh, let me... Um, just then emphasize one other thing. So it is important. So we need to be able to verify time. We need to be able to, to, to see, okay, do we have time left? So that means that inside this, inside our kernel, we need to put verification points, the points in the code where we, where we must check the time, whether we have enough time to run or, or it's time to, to roll back the transaction. So this is a very delicate thing. And this is essentially why we uh, limited our services to, to the amount of services that were limited. So, uh, and this is probably the most um, time consuming and, and important part of that design. So obviously every runtime call needs, needs to have this verification point. Obviously every loop needs to have a verification point uh, for, uh, on every loop iter iteration, right? But what's more important that, that those time measurements, they depends, they heavily depends on the operating system environment and on the hardware that that operating system is running on. So what we've done, uh, we've, we've taken several, uh, several setups that we claim to support. And we've measured the maximum interval between control points on every supported architecture. And then we made sure that we, did, we, we added control points when necessary so that we guarantee that the transaction never run past, past the, its, its deadline. So uh, then there's certain, certain techniques to estimate control point value, to estimate the time when, the, uh, when it's time to interrupt transaction. And again, we, 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 we assert that uh, half of the deadline is generally safe. Uh, uh, then it goes to methods to enforce deadline, and essentially that too. Data, the database runtime doesn't have doesn't have a way to measure time itself. It's just a library. So we either use an application created uh, timer, or we use an application created callback. In the absence of the timer. So, uh, 
And our API, our, our real-time API, supports both of those methods. Again, we either measure, we either use a timer created by the application, or we use a callback, and the application handles the time. All right, so uh, Andres, I got, I got to cut you off. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, okay. Well, um, I, I, again, so I, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Thank you for, for being here. So we have time for one question, if anyone in the audience. Okay, uh, so I, I'll ask my question. So in the in the very beginning, you showed the the example of essentially you, you define it's like an ORM. You define the schema in a in a C struct or C class, and then you convert that into you know C code that that you write your application against. But then you also showed a bunch of other sort of APIs that you supported. Like you 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 had JNI, you had you mentioned Lua and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. I had and you had one where you had embedded SQL. So I guess my my question would be: What percentage of your customers are using Extreme DB through like the standard C API versus something like SQL? It, well, it depends on the uh, on the field. Uh, embedded customers, I would say fifty, half. Okay. Uh, financial. People in financial arena, they of course use SQL because uh, I mean, there's no way not to use it. Uh, yeah. uh, customers who use our distributed designs, all of them, 90% of them use SQL. Yeah. But in, again, in embedded settings, it's mostly, it's mostly either C or Java, but it's 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 it's, uh, it's a language called API. It's uh, not fair enough. Okay. All right. Well. All right. Thank, All right. So, yeah, thank I, you very I, much. I, thank you so much for being with us. We, we we appreciate you spending time with us and and explaining that this the type of database system we normally don't see about. So that's super interesting. Mm -hmm.